In the vast universe, there is a planet called the Mother Star. Thousands of emperors have successively ruled, and ordinary people all submit to their rule. However, the royal bloodline's greed for power has depleted the planet's resources. The kingdom is forced to send its army to venture into the vastness of space and plunder resources from other planets. The atrocities of the Mother Star quickly sparked a rebellion, and an assassin fired the first shot of revolution. He knocked down the emperor and queen, putting an end to the royal bloodline. After the demise of the emperor, chaos ensues, and the world falls into disarray. The planet, which had long suffered under the oppression of the Mother Star, begins to brew a greater revolution. There is an elder named Balasar, who seizes the opportunity to declare himself the regent of the Mother Star. He sends his most brutal commander to the outskirts of the Mother Star's dominion, searching and suppressing those rebellious insurgents. And our heroine Cora, living in a remote village, she is not a native of this place. Instead, she was born amidst the war. Cora spent two seasons in the peaceful village, yet she still couldn't adapt to the mundane life because the war deprived her of the ability to enjoy happiness. Cora always felt that an unexpected event could happen at any moment. However, no one expected it to come so quickly. As the regent's warship arrived in the sky above the farmland, Cora immediately rang the village alarm bell. The people in the village gathered together for a meeting. Young Gona didn't miss a chance to make money. He proposed trading with the people from the Mother Star, hoping to sell this year's harvest at a good price. But Cora knew the temperament of the regent. He came here to plunder everything, let alone the fact that Gona had sold food to the Mother Star's archenemy, the rebels. Last year, Cora expressed that all we can do now is to hide our wealth and not reveal how fertile this land is. Hopefully, they will quickly leave after looting the food. Just as she finished speaking, the enormous warship descended. The village chief went to welcome the leading General Arti and invited him into the council chamber. General Arti got straight to the point and demanded the villagers' cooperation in searching for a small group of revolutionaries hiding there. The leader's nickname is Blood Axe, and her brother, Darian, is also present. The village chief hurriedly declined. We are just humble farmers. We don't have the ability to help. General Arti responded, Since you are farmers, you must have food. You can supply us with food, and the purchase price will be three times the market price. The village chief remembered Cora's warning and explained that this land is abundant in rocks, and arable land is scarce. The harvest is barely enough to sustain everyone, and there is simply no surplus food to sell to the Mother Star. However, as soon as Gona heard about the triple market price, immediately throw all worries out of the way, and told the general about the skyrocketing harvest and the existence of food reserves in the village. Unexpectedly, after hearing this, Arti not only did not reward Gunnar, General Arti instructed the village chief on how to deal with his insolent subordinates. After saying that, he picked up a nearby cane, and just as Gona was terrified, General Arti turned around and struck down the village chief. It turns out that the insolent subordinates, referred to by General Arti, were the village chief who attempted to deceive the Mother Star. General Arti directly struck the village chief, knocking him down. He also casually slashed at the village chief's wife who was rushing towards him. He turned around and asked Gona how long it would take for them to supply food. And seeing the situation, Gona didn't dare to deceive him. Hastily replying, nine weeks later, Gona stated, I will come back to inspect the goods in ten weeks, and you need to provide 10,000 bushels of food for the warship, but the entire village can barely produce 12,000 bushels. The Mother Star wants to starve the entire village to death. After the general left, a small team remained stationed. The leader, Big Brows, selected a suitable residence. He ordered his subordinate, Little Horse, to drive away the residents inside, so they could move their equipment inside. The remaining people opened the military green boxes. Inside were the new robotic soldiers of the Mechanized Legion, JC-14. We can call them the Imperial Guards. Private Ares asked JC-14 for assistance. Together, they moved the supplies to the camp. Little Horse was excited to see JC-14. It is said that after the Emperor was assassinated, the programming of the Mechanized Legion changed. No matter how you deal with them, these robots won't fight back. Saying that, he fired a shot at JC-14. Ares couldn't stand it. He stepped forward and blocked Little Horse. Big Brows quickly pulled them apart. Tell them to move the supplies quickly, then instruct JC-14 to go to the riverside and clean up. Indeed, it's advanced technology. Robots can directly wash in the river. 
A girl named Sauhua from the village comes over to strike up a conversation. She even hands JC-14 a towel. Gentle and beautiful Sauhua reminds JC-14 of Princess Isabella. She is referred to as the Redeemer in legends. All soldiers of the mechanized legion will fight to protect the princess. Unfortunately, during her coronation ceremony, the princess, as well as the emperor and queen, were all assassinated by their most trusted person. I fear we lost some measure of our honor since that betrayal. Unlike the warm atmosphere by the riverside, the council chamber was extremely noisy. Tribute became the target of criticism. The villagers, in order to save their lives, intend to do their best in farming, to prove their worth to the mother planet. Upon hearing this, Keela returned to her room to pack her belongings. Unlike everyone else, she is not naive. She knows that if she wants to survive, she has to run. Old Bai, who took in Keela, couldn't help but speak up. When I found you in the wreckage of the warship, I was also worried that you would cause trouble for everyone. But the village still accepted Keela. Now is the time when people are needed. How can Keela abandon the villagers and not care about them? Old Bai wants her to go after the rebel forces that are pursuing the mother planet. Perhaps those people can defend the village. But Keela has already made up her mind to go. Just as she was about to prepare her horse to leave. Suddenly, she saw Xiaoma and others bullying Saohua. Only Arisken is willing to step forward and help. But he is outnumbered and quickly defeated. In a critical moment, Keela appears holding an axe. A few soldiers see that the newcomer is a woman. They approach to disarm her. Keela seizes the soldier's guns and goes on a killing spree. Soon, a strong man comes over and disarms her. Keela seizes the opportunity and throws sand. She takes the opportunity to draw the strong man's dagger. In a short time, half of the soldiers stationed in the camp were killed. Ares Ken also takes advantage of the chaos and breaks free. Just as Keela is about to attack Xiaoma, suddenly, Big Brow points his gun at Xiaohua. He threatens Keela to stop immediately. Otherwise, he will blow Xiaohua's head off. Just then, JC-14 rushes over. Seeing the situation, Big Brow quickly gives orders, commanding JC-14 to take down Keela. Unexpectedly, the robot picks up a gun from the ground, and directly shoots down Big Brow. It seems that the conversation by the riverside had an effect. JC-14 doesn't want to harm Saohua. It turns around and leaves the scene. Shortly after, the villagers arrive. Keela casually kills the dying Xiaomar. Now, except for Ares Ken, the station troops are completely wiped out. Admiral Arti will arrive 10 weeks later. He will certainly seek revenge. Even if Keela resists, she must stay and fight for the villagers. Old by hands over a uniquely designed gun. He solemnly hands it over to Keela. It's something he found together in the wreckage of a battleship. He was worried it was too dangerous and had never brought it out before. Now is the time to return it to its rightful owner. After Keela is ready, she plans to set off. She wants to find well-trained warriors. Together, they will fight against the Regent King. And Keela's first target is General Titus. He was once a hero of the kingdom, but later he led a rebellion. Now, we are at odds with our home planet. As for where to find this general, we'll have to ask Nagong. This guy sold food in Tianyu City last year. He had connections with the rebels, so Nagong will lead us to the contact person. The villagers watch the two of them leave. On the way, Nagong couldn't help but ask Keela, you used to be a soldier from our home planet, right? Judging by the appearance of the gun, your rank must have been high. Keela fell into memories upon hearing this. She was only nine years old when she encountered the military of our home planet. At that time, Belyasa was just a general. He had an insane passion for battle. Keela's people fought bravely to protect their homeland. They organized a heroic defense battle. Unexpectedly, it attracted Belias's retaliation. He almost massacred the entire city with his men. Nine-year-old Keela raised her gun at Belyasa. The latter probably found this scene amusing. He lowered his weapon and approached Cora, and he held the barrel of the girl's gun against his own chin. Keela didn't hesitate. In the next second, she pulled the trigger. Unfortunately, there were no bullets inside. In the end, Belyasa killed all her family. But he only took Cora away with him, because he knows this girl will become a great person. In the days that followed, Belyasa became Keela's teacher and father. He often took the girl on missions. Cora lived with the soldiers on the battleship for five years. She quickly became one of them. Keela even fell in love with a comrade from the Marshall Academy, until the comrade died in battle. 
The endless warfare felt like hell. When Keela turned 18, she was already an officer, responsible for commanding a team in battle. She displayed Belias's charisma on the battlefield. Her fierce aura sent shivers down people's spines. Keela fought for emperors in distant worlds, even though the army she served in had once killed her entire family. The memories came to a temporary halt. The two of them soon arrived at Chienu City. Nagon was about to find the contact person. When he saw the contact person being captured by bounty hunters, it seems they need to find an alternative route. The two of them entered a tavern one after the other. People from various planets were present. They cast curious glances at the newcomers' faces. Nagon pointed out King Levitica, who provides shelter for the Blood Axe clan. We can directly contact the people of Levitica. Keela thought it was too risky, just as the two of them were in distress. A guy with a pig-like face suddenly came over to strike up a conversation. He actually took a liking to Nagong, and even wanted to invite him upstairs. Keela advised him kindly, but this guy didn't listen. Anyway, everyone in the tavern is watching now. So Keela straightforwardly asked if anyone knew General Titus. Suddenly, a strange half-naked man spoke up. He had seen General Titus at the Borax Star Arena. The two main characters were planning to find a ship and set off. But then that pig-faced guy returned with his henchmen. It seemed that this fight was inevitable. Korra is a super elite warrior who has survived countless battles. The pig-faced guy's henchmen were no match, but they couldn't withstand the sneak attacks from these people. Brother Pighead didn't know when he quietly sneaked up behind Korra. Fortunately, a long-haired man intervened just in time to help. He took valuable items from the pig-faced guy. Then he called out to Keela, who was ready to leave. The long-haired man explained that his spaceship was at the spaceport. It could take the two of them to Borak Star. Just give a small fee for the passage. This way, they saved time on renting a ship. Keela and the long-haired man boarded his spaceship and set off. Upon hearing that they were planning to form a rebel army against their home planet, he recommended a candidate. That person was on the farm on the Wordy Star. Cora felt that since they were traveling the same way, it wouldn't hurt to take a look. The spaceship quickly arrived at the farm outskirts. The person introduced by the long-haired man was named Tietuo. He was working for the farm owner because he was in debt. Keela noticed that Tietuo had iron chains tied around his legs. She knew that he had offended their home planet. So Tietuo was very willing to join. But the problem was that he still had to work to repay his debt. Keela and Gunnar didn't have much money on them. After some contemplation, the farm owner proposed a gamble. As long as Tietuo could tame the fierce beasts in the yard, his past debts would be forgiven. This farm owner was quite eccentric. So, if the protagonist didn't come, you wouldn't make the bet, right? This storyline is purely to showcase the new character's abilities. Suddenly, the tall and muscular Tietuo was instantly possessed by a Disney princess. He said a few inspirational words to the giant bird. Then he gave it a loving caress. The fierce beasts obediently surrendered. What else could it be if not a Disney princess? Tietuo rode the giant bird soaring in the sky. Halfway through, the giant bird probably felt something was wrong. How did I easily get swayed by a muscular man? so it flapped its wings and crashed into a rock. This inexplicable bird-taming subplot, combined with various slow-motion close-ups, it's hard not to suspect that the director is showing off the casting, because every shot is expressing. Look at the muscular arms of our male actor. Look at that flowing hair and determined gaze. In the end, Tietuo completes the task and clears his debt. He leaves with the main group. The scene switches to the planet Daxus, a metallic drilling and mining planet. Our Korean actress Pei Duna makes her appearance. Since she appears, she must not be a simple character. Duna is the second person introduced by the man with long hair. Duna is the guardian of the impoverished district. And a nearby woman quickly approaches her for help, crying that her daughter was captured by a spider-like creature, following her gaze upward. Indeed, they see a spider-like creature holding a child. Duna asks the creature to release the child. But the spider-like creature is also feeling wronged. This planet used to be picturesque. But the mining team destroyed its original ecological environment. Toxic gases have caused the spider-like creature's eggs to become diseased. Making it impossible to hatch healthy offspring. Unable to give birth. It resorts to snatching others' children. And Duna understands its situation. 
However, she emphasizes that there is a cause and effect, presenting facts and reasoning, hoping to persuade the spider-like creature not to harm everyone indiscriminately. But the creature insists, I won't listen, I won't listen, I will kill all your children, and make everyone regret coming here to mine. Since it's come to this, there's nothing more to say. Duna pulled out two knives and fought the spider monster. The latter fought back with his pointed legs. Duna wanted to rush forward and hit the target. Unexpectedly, she was kicked away by a spider monster. The monster lifted its massive body and jumped up, seeing its sharp legs about to strike. Duna quickly grabbed her short knife and forcefully chopped off the spider monster's legs. Meanwhile, Gongna ran out to protect the girl. However, she was quickly discovered by the spider monster. Fortunately, Duna came to support. She unleashed a set of magnificent combos and ruthlessly pierced the spider monster's abdomen. But Duna didn't feel the joy of victory at all because she knew she was in a chaotic and turbulent era where everyone was not in control of their own fate. And the root of all this was the tyranny of the mother planet. So she joined Kola's team and returned to the spaceship. Afterwards, Kola praised Gona for standing up for the child. Kindness is the most precious quality. There was a time when she didn't understand this truth at all. Kola had fought many victorious battles for the mother planet in the past. To commend her loyalty and devotion, the emperor bestowed upon Kola the title of Royal Elite Guardian and appointed her as the personal guard of Princess Isabella. This was the highest honor imaginable. Earlier, JC14 mentioned that the princess is the savior because she possesses the power of resurrection. Therefore, Isabella symbolizes love and peace. One day, the emperor privately told Kola that after the princess ascends to the throne as the queen, a better era will arrive. Kola also trusts the kind-hearted princess, believing she has the ability to save the world. That's why Kola said kindness is the most precious quality. Unfortunately, Isabella's tragic death shattered that hope. At this moment, the five-member group arrived at the planet Pollux. They entered the famous gladiator arena. Inside, the crowd was roaring. The smell of blood permeated the air. General Titus collapsed drunk on the main road. A dirty stray creature was sniffing around him. Kola hired a woman to clean him up. Titus was awakened by cold water, but he still looked like a mess. All of his subordinates that he took away died tragically. Titus has yet to recover from that nightmare. However, judging by his muscles, it's clear that Titus hasn't neglected his training. If he were truly giving up and surrendering, he would at least be like Thor in Avengers, Endgame. So Kola started talking and successfully recruited Titus. On the other side, the bounty hunter took the contact person to meet with Otti because this person knew the whereabouts of the blood axe in order to save his life. He immediately revealed that Levitica had hidden the blood axe. After obtaining the desired information, Otti directly killed the contact person. He ordered his subordinates to dissect the person's brain to see if they could find more information. Then, he prepared to embark on a journey to meet King Levitica. Coincidentally, Kola and the others are currently on the planet Sholan. Sholan is the home planet of King Levitica. He has already conveyed the news of Korra's request to Blood Axe. It is believed that a response will be received soon. Kola and the companions are preparing to take their leave. However, the legendary Blood Axe family appeared. Kola immediately explained their purpose. The warships from their home planet invaded the villages of Gorna. They needed warriors to help defend the farmers. Initially, the Blood Axe family hesitated to risk the lives of their subordinates. However, Kola gave them a stern lecture, because during the Blood Axe family's most difficult times, Gorna took risks to sell them food. The Blood Axe family and their brother, Darjan, are not ungrateful people. Therefore, they agreed to help. Of course, the lives of warriors are not to be taken lightly. Darjan allowed them to decide whether to stay or leave. If they didn't step forward to protect the weak and resist their home planet, the revolution would be meaningless. Therefore, most warriors were willing to follow Darjan. Even the man with long hair wanted to stay and help. He was inspired as he followed Kola along the way and planned to fight alongside everyone. However, before that, the man with long hair had something to take care of. He had something stored in the cargo hold that needed to be delivered to a buyer on Gondawa Star. At this point, Kola still didn't know that Sholan had turned into a hellish place. Otti raised his staff and killed King Levitica, and then fired upon Sholan. The entire planet was annihilated in the bombardment. Meanwhile, 
Otty received information from the bounty hunter, and left the cruiser juncher behind to carry out the bombing mission, while he personally prepared to capture the Blood Axe family. On the other side, the man with long hair spaceship arrived at Gondua Star, and docked at the Grey Market. He then asked Cola and the others, to move the grey-coloured box down. The group followed the instructions and made the delivery on the dock. Darjan deployed several ships to guard the airspace. At that moment, Cola noticed a man with a pig-like nose. He exchanged secretive glances with the man with long hair. Cola then realized there was a mole in the team. It turned out that the man with long hair was the bounty hunter who had betrayed them. The next moment, Otty's fleet began bombarding. The gray box on the ground activated its mechanism, locked up the protagonist group. They were bound by iron claws and unable to move. The man with long hair's plan was calculated and impactful. He helped Cola introduce Tietuo and Duna, and went with them to find General Titus. Because all these people were on the wanted list, the man with long hair could gather them all and capture them. Immediately after, Otti arrived at the dock with his men. He put on a self-satisfied look. After all, these individuals had high bounties on their heads. Otti could achieve a successful promotion with this operation, to ensure nothing went wrong. He instructed the man with long hair to paralyze these people, using a device to immobilize the main group. There was a hole directly facing the spine. Just push the syringe in, and the trapped individuals would be paralyzed. The man with long hair forced Gorner to do it himself, but he underestimated the courage of this farmer. Gorner took the opportunity to open Kola's device, then turned and stabbed the syringe into the man with long hair. Kola swiftly grabbed a guard's gun. She dodged the hail of bullets. She shot and exploded a nearby oil drum. Gorner took the opportunity to save the others. A full-scale battle erupted between the two sides. The main group proved their elite status. They quickly stabilized the situation. Darjan commanded the soldiers to enter the warship, but before they could take off, Otti signaled towards the airborne warship, and directly blew up the rebels inside the warship. Seeing this, Darjan drew a long sword from a corpse. He fought his way forward. Stepping on the slanted hoist, he rushed towards the enemy ship. Darjan traced an arc in the air, and stabbed towards the pilot. Unfortunately, the opponent dodged by turning their head. They immediately retaliated with several shots towards Darjan, but this leader persevered, and with superhuman awareness, killed the pilot. The uncontrollable warship descended slowly. Kola was inspired by this scene. She shouted and charged forward. She dodged a falling warship with a sliding maneuver and successfully reached Otti's side. The warship at that moment crushed the dock. Otti rolled down the slope. Kola followed closely behind. The two fought on top of a tower. Otti brandished his staff and pressed forward step by step. He quickly gained the upper hand. Otti approached and broke a rope. Fortunately, Kola grabbed onto the iron wall in time. She used the broken rope to bind Otti, and successfully climbed back to the ground. This action scene was quite exciting. In conclusion, the two fought fiercely for a while. In the end, Kola finally struck Otti with a stick and killed him. The Iron Tower trapped the tower where Kola was located, and pulled her over to join them. Today's battle will undoubtedly cause severe damage to the Mother Planet, because a few criminals and nameless soldiers took down their prideful war machines. But for Kola and the others, it will be a fresh start. The main group is preparing to return to the village. On the other side, people on the mother planet recovered Otti's body and activated the device on him. It turns out that this guy is a robot. The staff reactivated him. Then they sent Otti to meet Bali. The regent ordered him to do whatever it takes to kill the antagonist and capture Kola. The movie ends here. To be honest, the plot doesn't have many highlights. The character development is average, but at least it's from a great director so the budget is sufficient, and the special effects are on point. The film has its own aesthetics. The impressive aspects are all technical and superficial. After watching, it feels like having a fast food meal. It's the familiar taste of the masses. It can please the taste buds and satisfy the stomach. Not much nutrition. All in all, this film is a super mature commercial masterpiece.